In the early 1970s, before Vauxhall threw its hat into the ring with the Mark I Cavalier, if you were buying a family saloon or a fleet car, you had a choice of basically just two brands, Ford or British Leyland. Yep, Ford had basically dominated the fleet market with the Cortina in the 60s, whereas BL was making innovative front-wheel drive cars, which didn't really appeal to those fleet buyers at all. So came up with the Marina, simple, mechanicals, rear-wheel drive, to take on what was then the Mark II Cortina. But then Ford changed the game again with the American-styled and much bigger Mark III Cortina. But over 50 years on from when these cars were battling it out on dealer forecourts, with no buyers or rose-tinted spectacles or brand loyalties to uphold, which one of these family car favourites is best? Let's find out. But first, our friends at Lancaster Insurance are running monthly giveaways. You can win all sorts, from experience days to tools, restaurant vouchers and tech. So click the link below at the end of the video to enter their latest competition. So Joe, your first marina experience. Now, obviously we're both car journalists, but neither of us seem to get the memo that suggests that you have to be down on the marina straight away. Yeah, it's quite a common thing, isn't it? We've spoken before, it appears in so many worst car ever books and crap cars, and obviously there's the uh, <clears throat> slightly, just slightly cliche jokes about pianos, don't know where that came from. Yeah. First impressions, really rather pleasant. Yeah, I don't think the marina deserved any of the vitriol it received. I mean, like I said, BL, they really did have this problem that whatever they did, they just couldn't do right. In the 60s, they came up with innovative front-wheel drive cars like the Mini. AGO 16. Loads of room inside, neat styling, lovely car. Really appealed to private buyers, just not the fleet market, because it was just perceived as too complex with that hydroelastic suspension. Everyone wanted a Cortina. Rear-wheel drive, nice and simple, great. And of course then BL, thought, well, we could do with a slice of that pie. And they came up with uh, the Marina concept. Now, considering they basically came up with it in a boardroom just two and a half years before it emerged, the development sketch to production time is ridiculously short. The fact that this car existed at all, let alone the fact that it sold in so many hundreds of thousands, is a remarkable achievement. Yeah. And when you consider that little old BL didn't have the millions to chuck at it like Ford did, no. the Mar-3 Cortina was a tens of millions exercise. But you know what? This doesn't feel like a bargain bin comparison. It feels fine. I mean, that B-Series engine, we've got a 1.8 here, single carb, and yeah. Pulls all right, doesn't it? It actually goes. You know, the TC was actually quicker than the MGB, the coupe. I'm liking that. Steering, you know what? I would say it's a lot more direct than the Cortina. It's a lot more precise. It's got a nice weight to it. And the ride, I mean... Yeah, the oh. ride's not bad at all, is it? I mean, you compare this to a modern car on low-profile tyres, and this rides really nicely. Yeah, this is nice and smooth and pillowy. I mean, there's no denying, we've heard all the jokes about marina handling with the understeer and being dangerous. The handling thing is a little bit overstated. Basically, it was the early press cars, renowned for chronic understeer. Journalists from Auto Car and Motor got together, really unusually, went up to Longbridge to basically say to VL, this needs sorting out. And so they redesigned the Trunnion, lower kingpin, give it a bit more negative camber, and that really solved the problem, made it a lot better. Oh, honestly, the problem is massively overstated, it's especially not... on the smaller engine car, yeah. on the 1.3. Not really an issue. It's not tight and sharp and composed, but you know what? I mean, even if I do an emergency swerve like that, <laughs> we're not falling over in the car, are no, we? No, we're not. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be a bit of a body roll. It's a, it's a family saloon. It's the average yeah. Joe car. Well, Sorry, Joe. <laughs> That's what it was for. It wasn't meant to go tearing around racetracks and things, right. although yeah, obviously BL actually did do some competition with it quite successfully. It could take on the Escort being slightly bigger, but it could also eat into that Cortina market. With the bigger 1.8 yeah. they were going to offer. And you say about it being simple, and it was, because of course, in an effort to make a rear-wheel drive platform as convenient to create as possible, BL dipped into the parts bit, didn't they? They looked back at the Miner, a proven car, Morris Miner, based it on the platform of that with the same lever arm sort of damper at the front. The A-Series engine was proven. The B-Series engine was proven. For the A-Series, they used a, a Triumph gearbox. Again, a proven product. Nothing really new, but they closed it in this quite attractive and very contemporary body. They knew how successful the Cortina was, so they basically poached the same designer. So Roy Haynes did the majority of work on the Marina, keeping his kind of corporate look that he also designed the Maxi and the Mini Clubman, of course, and it looked good. It was contemporary. He had everything simple behind the skin, but a nice, attractive body, and it did work. Though the Marina never actually sold as well as the Cortina, it was second in 1973, and 1.1 million were sold in the end. 
which you is know, no small figure. Which is not bad at all, especially given the reputation that BL70 stuff had. You'd be forgiven for thinking it was an absolute disaster. It just wasn't. It just stayed in production too long. They knew it was compromised, but they thought it would only last for five years before they could come up with something else. It's not the marina's fault no. that it just stayed in production for too long. You know what? Driving this car today, I am thoroughly impressed with it. Yeah. It's, it's composed. It doesn't feel wobbly. The ride is superb. I say I like the way it looks. And that 1.8 is a sweetie. Yeah, it's, it's good energy. genuinely. In 1971, this car was fun. I agree you know, with that. it wasn't standout, but it was certainly not bad. No. And this is the point. Everyone thinks it's bad. It wasn't. It wasn't bad. It lived too long. And of course, by the late 70s, when you had the Mark 1 Cavalier and things like that, yes, then it was outclassed, but it was simply a good method of transport. And sometimes, if you're making a family saloon or a fleet car, which is what this was meant to be, yeah. that's exactly what you want. It didn't need to be so complicated. Let's set the record straight here and now. The Morris Marina is not only not a bad car, but in many ways, a very good one. And you know what, Jeff? I like it. It's all right. Now then, let's see how the other half lived. Indeed. So from Blue Marina to Blue Oval, Jeff, welcome at last to the Mark III yes. Ford Cortina. Finally, the chance to get behind the wheel of a car that I've admired for some time, but never actually driven. Bit of a Ford man, aren't you? Didn't your dad have one? I would bang on about our Mark IV Roman bronze 2-litre GL to pretty much anybody who'd listen. <laughs> this is a long time past that. This car is now a classic and it's cool. What do you think of it? It is very, very cool. I mean, just the way the Mark III looks. Peak Cortina styling, isn't it? The Coke mm. bottle look. The first thing that sort of strikes me from behind the wheel, just how ahead of its time it feels. It feels modern. It doesn't feel like I'm in a car that's, you nearly know, 50 years nearly old. 50 years old. This is actually a very differently engineered car to the Marina. So obviously, it's not just the styling is American inspired, specifically it was the uh, Mercury Montego, not the Austin Montego, that uh, <laughs> inspired this styling. And when you look at pictures of the two, you can totally see it. As the Coke bottle profile, as you say, it's a gorgeous looking thing. Underneath, it was all new as well. Unlike the Mark 1 and Mark 2 Cortina, we got double wishbone suspension, which meant they weren't so much gunning for the racetrack. You didn't get a uh, Lotus version of this. You didn't get a Mexico or an RS. You got the GT. You got more comfortable cars. This was a much bigger car than its predecessor, so it was it was American in feel as well as in look. I think what the Mark 2 did so well with the 1600E was bring this whole badge hierarchy thing in. The Mark 3 continued that really well. Base, the L, the XL, the GXL. It's not just the big badge and the L on this is enormous. It's the th obvious things, it's the chrome arch trims, it's the four light grills, yeah. and in the GXL, that faux wood dash with the separate dials, it was so cool. Or well, the GT with the tombstone seats. Oh, oh, beautiful. Those seats are worth a pretty penny on their own these days. I can imagine. The Mark III Cortina was a big step sideways. It was longer, it was wider, it had more sound deadening. Yeah. So altogether, it's aimed more at the motorway cruiser or indeed the fleet buyer, but for me, that's what makes it actually a better car in the real world, and particularly a better classic today. Well, yeah, it moved up a class, didn't it? I mean, it was instead of being topped off with a 1.6, it was now topped off with a 2-litre. The introduction of the Pinto engines, of course, the, yeah. the overhead cam, although this is a, is a Kent, isn't it? From, it's a 1.6 crossflow in this one, yeah. so it's about 75 horsepower, and as you will now sample, it actually goes all right. It does go all right. I mean, that was one of the carryovers from the Mark II, but uh, it was still plenty talky enough to pull this bigger car along. It's not going to change the 1.8 Marina that we're stacking it up against today. But compared to a 1.3 Marina, it would warp all over it. It drives really well, doesn't it? I wouldn't have thought this was a sort of 1.6. No. This is nice and smooth. and It's still a lovely thing to cruise in today. The gearing's spot on. It does 35 to the gallon. And you can tell, the first thing you said when we got in this car, it feels big in here. It does. A lot it does more space. Big. I've got more space down here and more space in the back for the kids. The boot is a lot bigger than in the Marina. You can see why they were best sellers. I mean, more than the sum of its parts, isn't yeah. it? I mean, they weren't the most dynamic in terms of handling or anything like that. It's a bit of a rolly old girl. And yeah. I would argue in many ways, the Marina is potentially more composed. But here's, well, here's the thing. Early on, these Mark III Cortinas were blighted with suspension problems just like the Marina. Do you hear people talking about that? No, nope. not really. In the 60s and 70s, BL could seemingly do no right, as we said, yeah. and Ford could do no wrong. No, because they could do right, because this... they were so clever at marketing. Exactly. So, so clever. The thing is, I thought this was quite a refined car for his age. The sound in here is not too bad, the ride is lovely, everything else, but I do think in terms of refinement, despite those dated underpinnings, the Marina feels more comfortable, yeah. more relaxed. I would agree with that. I mean, it just feels like the Marina is 
has slightly more rounded edges. Yeah, that probably does mean that, I mean, this isn't a sports saloon, as we said, but on a windy road like this, I do think this would leave the Marina behind. I think this inspires more confidence. What I love about the Mark III Cortina is it's proof that when Ford don't just phone it in, when they put their all into something, throw their millions and all their ability at something to do pretty much a ground-up new car, like they did with the Mark III over the Mark II, they prove just how brilliant they can be. This was a genuine step up over the Mark II, yeah. even though not everyone saw that, and it was good enough to survive into the 80s with the Mark V. It's funny, isn't it, that people still loved the Cortina right up to its death when the Sierra came out. Yeah. Whereas the Marina, by that point, and indeed the Atal, was a bit of a joke. People were mocking it. Now, yeah. as we've said, I do think the Cortina was the better car, but the gap was nowhere near as big as people made out, and it's yet more proof that Ford just have that image and that status that BL never quite achieved. We put these cars back to back today, and that means you get to look at all their fine details, and you're directly comparing things like the ride and the performance and the space. But in its own right, I think the Mark III Cortina is a fantastic car, and a really well-rounded package, truth be told. I've been pleasantly surprised by the Marina. People would do well to ignore the tired cliches about it, and it runs a Cortina close, but I grew up loving Cortinas. I'm a big fan of BL. There is absolutely no way on earth I'm picking a Marina over the Cortina. I like Cortinas. That's my own bias showing through. But I tell you what, there will be people that prefer the Marina. I wouldn't blame them. The fact is that it's a very close run thing. There is nowhere near the enormous gulf that people would make out. And the Morris Marina doesn't deserve its bad reputation, but this most definitely deserves its good one. So let us know in the comments then, Cortina or Marina, Blue Oval or BL? Can I have the keys back now? No. This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link below to enter their latest competition.